What's going on, everyone? Welcome to our live stream panel, Progressive Action TV. And we're going to discuss this current contract proposal. I have two intelligent men with me. I was trying to get some women, but you know, they was busy Sunday, got to get the kids together and things of that nature. But um, hopefully other people will be joining us on this on this panel. But for right now, I have train operator Seth Rosenberg and bus maintainer Mark Blaze. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing well, doing well. Could always be better. Hanging in there. You? Yeah, you said, so Seth, look, I just want to jump straight into it. How do you feel about the contract proposal. And I want to start on a general level. I don't want to get into the um, departmental stuff right now. I do want to touch on some departmental stuff, but I want to talk about the things that affects everyone as far as like healthcare, wages, things of that nature. Where do you stand with these um, current contract proposals? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a horrible contract. Um, I it's I, There's two pieces to that. I mean, the two big things, right? I, I, to summarize, I would say it's a contract with um, wage cuts for at least the first two years when you take inflation into account. Overall, it's going to be a wage cut. We're going to be behind with respect to inflation when we end the contract. That's for sure. And um, there are some sweeteners in there. There's some, you know, there are some good things in there, uh, such as the expanded maternity leave and you know a little bit of paternity leave. The care for autism um, is is a good thing as well. The problem is that right the MTA knows this. When they do the numbers, they put those little line those line items in there, and they know they don't cost that much compared to even a one percent wage increase, which affects everyone in the union for for every year. It gets compounded with other raises. So they're willing to give a list of things that make the contract look filled out when the bones of it, the meat of it, are the uh, the yeah. wages and they're below, they're horrible. So that's one piece, right? And we can talk more about that. But the, I thought the, that was bad before, but there's a, an, a huge give back in there as well, which we have to spend some time talking about, um, which is that, uh, and, the, and, and the union is being very dishonest with respect to this, that um, retirees are being stabbed in the back, that uh, currently, we have three plans available. One is traditional Medicare, and two are Medicare Advantage, which is a for-profit scam, um, which they can gatekeep your care, unlike traditional Medicare, with a supplement that covers the extra percentage, wh where you control what you do, you and your doctor decide. With Medicare Advantage, then it's basically like an HMO, where the insurance company decides what you need and what you don't need, and they are trying to make money off of it. Um, and so the less, that, the more they deny, the, le the, the more profit that they make. So it turns out that originally there were three plans, um, two Medicare Advantage and the one that was traditional Medicare. And if you look at the contract proposed, there are only two plans and they're both Medicare Advantage. And it's very telling that it doesn't even say Medicare Advantage on either of those two. They, are, mm -hmm. they know that Medicare Advantage is toxic in New York City because They've been trying to, uh, Mayor Adams has been trying to get um, uh, Medicare Advantage forced on city worker retirees, and they've been fighting it with protests. They've won in court a couple of times, and it's gone back and forth. There's a big lawsuit right now because the retirees are up in arms because they know that it's going to erode their care. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, so, so not only are they stabbing retirees in the back, they know that it's unpopular, and they're doing everything they can to make it see, uh, to sort of slide it through. I made a mistake at first. I didn't notice that that was the case. So, you know, just, I'm trying to do a quick summary and we can dig deeper into the items. Um, but uh, so below inflation wage increases um, that are gonna, that they really mean a pay cut over three years. Uh, a, a list of a couple of things that are, are good, but do not balance out and really put, uh, all together put the union behind, plus a major give back that they're being dishonest about, which is stabbing retirees in the back and forcing them onto Medicare Advantage. 
All right. We, so it's a it's a strong no vote. That that's a great um summary to begin. Mark Blaze, what problems do you have with the contract? All right. So my main issue with the contract, just to piggyback off what Seth said, yes, there are some sweeteners in here. Um, there's some great things with the paid maternity leave, uh, the medical coverage for autistic children. Uh, my son is actually autistic, so that that's a that's a great thing for me. But looking at the overall contract, the main thing that struck out to me was the wage, the wage increases and calculating inflation. This contract is not going to do anything for us. As far as monetarily in the next three years is, is not going to impact any purchasing power in your home. You know, the cost to purchase a home right now, interest rates are high, seven, eight percent. You know, inflation just trying to buy groceries, gas, any household items is high. So these increases are actually a pay cut. You know, and th this is this is my issue is what's being left on the table. If MTA was willing to agree to this three and three and three point five, you know, what's being left? I felt like we could have negotiated for more because this is not going to impact anyone. This doesn't feel like a victory. I don't know for how many members this feels like the wage increase is a victory, but for me, it just it does. It's not cutting it. Now, Mark Blaze, you you said something which I didn't know until now is that you have an autistic child. Um, yes. Prior to this contract, what problems did you have um, with the health insurance and the autism? Uh, right now, all his health insurance was being covered by the county, Nassau County. So I didn't have to come out of pocket for anything for him. When he turned three, of course, then he was gonna age out of early intervention. And then I would have to put him onto my insurance and we would have to go through the process of seeing what insurance covers and, and what it doesn't. So I'm sure this might add his uh, ABA therapies or any other services that he needed may have been covered under this new medical coverage. But as far as anything else that I have to pay for him out of pocket, that comes out of my salary. You know, So me getting the 3% increase is not going to aid my son in any way. That's interesting because I don't think enough people is even, you know, talking about that part of the contract. And I don't know too much about it myself, to be honest with you. Now, mm -hmm. Seth, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the wages, the percentages and inflation. Um, could you dig a little bit more deeper into, uh, you know, the inflation rate now versus the raises that are proposed in our contract? Sure. Um, so. Inflation last year, right, they do it month to month and it tracks back 12 months. So if we're looking right now at, for example, if you look at the inflation rate uh, in May, June of 2023, they're putting it around 5%, right? And that means that if you track back a year from now back to May of June of 2022, prices on average, when you take consumer goods and everything are 5% higher than they were last year, right? So if you, you know, if you were buying a loaf of bread for two dollars, right, then that loaf of bread has gone up five percent, right? Um, so that's like two dollars and ten cents on average. But you're going to get things that spike, like gas and things like that, or eggs, and then you're going to get things that are, you know, don't that aren't going. Up. So that's what they're looking at on average. And what you see, right, last year, right, the inflation rate was around nine to 10, 11 percent. And our raises last year, right? We got a raise of, uh, I think our last year raise was 2.75. So what that means, right, is that the numbers, when you look at your paycheck, the number has gone up, but the amount of goods and services you can buy, rent, food, clothing, right? Um, all that stuff, gas, all those things actually go, the amount you can buy is less. The amount of groceries you have with the same amount of money at, when you check out is less. And so if you have a pay raise that's under inflation, what that means, as, as I think Mark said, well, if you are taking a pay cut. And so we took a pay cut of about six and a quarter percent last year, right? That's huge. That's like the raise, you know, that's the opposite of, a, of an increase and that's just in one year. So now we're looking at, for this year, we're looking at inflation of about 5%. 
which means with a three, we're going to be taking a 2% pay cut. Um, and then the, if, you look at the, if you look at the stories in the news on economics, you'll see that the Federal Reserve, which controls interest rates in order to try and bring down inflation, is every story will tell you that they're like, inflation's not going down as quick as we thought it was going to, right? And so if you look at the predictions going forward, you predict that the inflation rate next year is going to be something like 4%, right? And so that means that we're still below inflation, right, with respect to our raise next year. So two of the three years of our contract, we're going to be below inflation and we're taking another pay cut. And so when you add it all together, we are going to end up uh, behind. And it's, you know, I want to pull back for one second, which is that, um, we have to look at it in the framework of coming out of COVID, right? We lost over 110 union members. We kept the system running, it risked our, our, our lives. And, you know, people like me tried to fight for safety thing and the TA was, you know, whether it was masks or trying to get social distancing on the trains, right? They didn't care. They just wanted us to come to work and run the trains. And if we get sick and died, then that was fine, right? That was fine for them, right? For, to them, our lives don't matter. And, you know, there was all this stuff about calling us heroes and stuff like that. But actions is what really decides it. And we haven't gotten hazard pay. This bonus is not hazard pay, right? It's that's uh, the essential worker thing is not hazard pay. Um, and uh, and they're telling us with these raise increases that we are worthless, that we that we kept the city running and we died and we got sick and pe thousands of us have long COVID and they and they're just going to spit in our face. This these below inflation raise increases are a insult and a spit in the face to everyone who kept the system running to our brothers and sisters who got sick and died. Um, and we have to look at it that way. And the fact that the union would try to um, sell this to us as a victory, right, is absolutely outrageous. Now, I have, I have a question, mm -hmm. for, uh, Mark Blades, as far as the, uh, the um, they call that the essential worker bonus where we get 3,000 this year and then a thousand um, dollars the next year. And I think that they tried, me personally, I think that they tried to um, convert it or make it seem like it was some type of hazard pay. But the funny thing is, is that retirees, um, if you retire before the ratification of this contract, you don't get that pay. You don't get nothing. And people who didn't help during the pandemic or wasn't here during the pandemic get that pay. How do you feel about that and us not getting hazard pay in general? Oh, well, to start with the hazard pay during the pandemic, I have three small children. So I had to continue to go to work in an environment and put my three small children at risk. That was one of the scariest moments of my life. But I did it every day. My, my union brothers and sisters, we did it every day. We took that chance. You know, we took that chance to keep the city moving. You know, now we were promised by Chuck Schumer that he was going to look out for us, you know, and for them to offer us $3,000 for risking our family's lives, my life, it, it really is an insult. You know, the fact that they didn't even mention at that table during this contract negotiation on the side of management to say, you know, we have to do something for these employees that risk their lives. You know, they, they, it's, it's like there's no, there's no emotion or, or heart behind management when it comes to our life, our safety. You, you just don't feel it and you don't, you don't see it, you know, with, with this offer. But let me ask you, you, I mean, if management don't see it, do you feel that our union reps ensured that they seen what we what we see what management don't see that i don't believe so because i don't see the 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 transparency from our union to let us know during these negotiations what was going on you know what were they being talked about what was going on at that table you know there was it was quiet there was there was no reaching out to the members to to tell them hey this is what's going on this is what we're currently discussing you know, we live in an age of, of technology now where the union could easily reach out to the members. 
if not through a Zoom, through YouTube, um, on foot, going to the depots, there's ways to get in contact with the membership, talking to the to, to the stewards. You know, we you could ask your, your your main steward and your location what's going on, and they don't even know because the leadership is not communicating with them what's going on. Mm. You know, so, there's a lot a lot of disconnect. So Seth, I want to I want to give you that same question. Richard Singleton is about to join us again. Um, how do you feel about the uh, the essential bonus, essential worker bonus? Um, that was offered to us. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I don't have much to add. I think it's an insult, right? We know, and we all know that bonuses are a trick that they use, right? Uh, you know, I, I say, you know, f the bonus, give me a higher, give me a higher um, raise because that raise will stick with me my entire career, right? In everyone's career here, right? It goes, it compounds with every future one. You give me a bonus, then that money, you know, I, I get whatever money I get. Uh, after taxes, and then it's done, right? So, you know, I, I think we deserve, I, I, I do think we deserve ha a hazard pay bonus, right? But this is just attempt to make it look good that people are going to accept the contract with lower wage increases. You know, I propose, I think every member deserves, what was it, $100 for every local 100 member who died, right? How about that? How about <laughs> every member, every one of us get $100 for every me member who died. So it's 110 members, right? At a hundred dollars a piece, that's ten thousand, like ten thousand one hundred dollars. How about that? Should it be tax free? You know, what? Should it be? Of course, it should be tax free. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Mr. So, but I thought, what's up, brother? Thanks How's for joining us. Uh, thank for you. Those who, I know. For those who don't know, that's Richard Singleton, esteemed station agent, twenty plus years. Yeah. Got about a hundred college degrees. Nah, I, try. <laughs> I try, I try, I try. So let, let me ask you, let me ask you the question. Um, since I didn't, since you just joined, how do you feel about the wage percentages, the three percent, the three percent, and the three point five percent over three years? Well, to be honest with you, this is like a, a two, three percent administration. That's all they can get us per year. They've been doing it for the last two or three contracts. Two percent, three percent, and some change. I'm not surprised. Uh, we're never going to get four or five percent per year. This is not what the administration is thinking about. Sam, not Sam Zutano mentioned that last contract. He said we're never going to get anything above, or uh, it's impossible to get anything above ten percent per per year. So he's not even aiming for that. So we've just been shortchanged as usual, two percent, way below the cost of inflation. So we basically got a pay cut. Salary's getting lower. Your dollar doesn't go as far as it used to be. I mean, many mm -hmm. years ago, you were able to go to Costco's and you get a whole bunch of groceries for about three hundred dollars. Now you're getting half of that for five hundred dollars, which is ridiculous. So you're beating the pay because you're being priced out of New York City. But this is all a part of the plan. Um, this is not something that's been happening overnight. This is something that's been thought about some time ago, and now you start to see you know, the progress of what they've been aiming for. So basically, the union is obviously stupid or incompetent. Either or, or they're just selling out because they can't count beyond, beyond four or five percent per year. They're stupid. They're incompetent because they can't even get what we're supposed to get. And they're fighting for you. This is your union money, right? They gave mm -hmm. them a significant pay raise, and they can't even match the pay raise that uh, for you that they got. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I kind of blame the membership because we can fight and we look for pity parties and we complain. We do all the yelling and screaming, but the time comes for um, election time comes around and we say, hey, can you sign my petition? Ah, oh, fuck that. I don't want to be part of the union. I don't care about this or that and the third. I don't care. Or uh, um, I'm voting for this guy because this guy saved my job. All this other nonsense. And then the contract comes along and you get peanuts and you start crying. When would the membership wake up? This is why I always toast Tremel, mm -hmm. like this progressive action, his team, and everyone else who fall under that progressive action umbrella, you are a disruptor, which is, happens like every 10, 20 years, maybe, depends on what industry you're in. This is a unionized industry, so therefore, it's going to take longer than it would be in the technology industry, which, as you notice, is changing every like two or three months, a new technology is coming out. So the union is not afraid. The union is afraid of Tramel Thompson's and, and, and the alikes. However, they really afraid of the disruptors. 
people's going to come get them old fat farmers out of business. Because that's all they are. They're sitting there getting fat off of your dime, and we just sitting there keep reelecting these fools and expect something different. What they say in the sanity is you keep repeating the same actions and expect a different outcome. Mm-hmm. That's who we are. Mm-hmm. We are the problem. It's the membership. They're going to sit there and get fat because we let them. They're complicit. Why? I went to the the congression, the last what it was um, convention, union convention in um, Las Vegas. There was no challenges, no opposition. There's no one fought against. There was no party to run against the current administration, right? So of course they're going to elect as the e-board member. You're going to have Kelly. You're going to have the Wichard, the Derricks, the uh, Vanessas, and whoever else they can find in Station's department that went along with the go along get along gang. They get rewarded, right? So how do you expect this organization to actually mm. do something for you when you don't have people? fighting against them. This is why I think it's important, whether I agree with progressive action or not, or any other party that comes into this institution and fight against the current administration, I got to admit, we need someone to hold them accountable, keep them responsible, expose what they're doing. And they don't like that. So they come up with fake pages. They come out with this truth squad and all this other nonsense. Some white guy just... Anyway, that's another story. But the point is, we need people to hold them accountable. And this is where I think progressive action and the likes and his team, you know, uh, is important in this administration. So I'm a bit long-winded, winded. I just came from South Newark, South Ward. It's been traffic, it's been crazy. (laughs) I'm trying to bring my height down a bit. I had some Starbucks. I'm trying to bring it down on a Sunday evening, but I'm gonna get there. So, So Seth, someone like Richard Singleton, close to retirement, probably can retire at any minute. Right. And the medical changes for him. What what right. are we what's what's next? Like how how do we hold them accountable for this type of blunder? Because they already sold out the unborn. They sold out the unborn. They went from three to five years top pay. We got a new pension system. And I've That's been true. saying for years. The only people left to sell out is the retirees. And it seems mm. like it's happening now. So how can we fight against that to make people say, look, because retirees don't got to vote. But at the end of the day, each one of us are potential retirees, right? Which means that we're going to mm-hmm. be affected by this. And I don't see the situation getting better medically, right? So what's inside the health benefits now that's very alarming to you like for an example i seen you say um the 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 insurance company is going to make the decision whether you basically live or die now and not your doctor right can you expand on that yeah i mean do you want me to go through the whole thing or should i do you want me to stick to the point that you just asked about well it's up to you just take it i want you guys to bounce off of each other i want the, just the conversation okay natural so, right. so, well, so, let me, so mm-hmm. Singleton, if you hear something, you know, raise your hand, interject. I just want this to be a conversation that flows. Yeah. Okay. Right. The same thing with you, Mark. All right. All right. I, I can definitely, you know, if we want to at some point, I can go through all the steps on how we're sure now that this is a major give back, stop stabbing retirees in the back. Um, that they're just to review quickly, right now, retirees have three options for healthcare, one of which is traditional Medicare with um, a supplemental plan that brings us up to the contractual level of insurance. Um, so with that plan, it's you basically have government Medicare, which is a quality uh, thing, a quality healthcare product taken by like 95% of um, uh, doctors uh, around the country. Uh, and you can go wherever you want, get your medical care, and then Aetna um, is manages the Part B, which covers the other 20% of that, but they have to follow whatever you got through Medicare, right? Now, the other two plans are Medicare Advantage, right? And there's a great article in The Nation magazine that talks about how Medicare Advantage is a for-profit scam that's neither Medicare nor an advantage for retirees, right? And basically what that means now is that instead of having Medicare which is uh, you know, proven and the government has it funded and you can, you can 
do uh, you can do what you want to get the health care you want with your doctor that with Medicare Advantage, it is run by an insurance company for profit. Right. And mm. uh, you can look at all the horror stories in the private sector with people who end up with Medicare Advantage as retirees um, that they basically the, the so the way it works is that the Medicare Advantage gets money from the government right, to run the system. And anything, any cost they cut or anything that they deny is just profit on top of that. So they have an incentive to cut care and to deny care, because if they do, their profit margin goes up. That's not the case with traditional Medicare. It's not mm -hmm. a for-profit system, right? So the way it would work for us, where it works for us with the Medicare Advantage plans is that the TA, they look at how many people are on the plan, the Advantage plan, the TA gives them a certain amount of money every year and uh, the more the more the less they pay out to doctors the more that they keep the more that Aetna keeps right and so we have stories from retirees who are denied care right because uh, the when they say okay this is what I want to do the bean counters in Aetna with Medicare Advantage are allowed to come in and say uh, oh wait is this really necessary we don't our, our doc you know our staff and our thing to say this you you this is not really necessary so you don't need that medicine or you that that procedure here's an alternative that we're going to suggest that's that's cheaper right um two really important pe the the three important pieces to that right if you look up could you bring up the page with just the two columns um let me say right right this is really the smoking gun because this is what was in what's in the the contract proposal that they're trying to pass through. Um, if, if you look at the previous one, actually bring up the one, if you could bring it up with three columns first. Which, um, which one, the color, the color one or the? The color one, bring up the color one. All right, I got you. I got you, give me a second. And I appreciate the other speakers. I'll try to get through this as quick as I can. Um, yeah, take your time. No, it's, it's it, fine, it's fine. So it, that, that, okay. that's more right there? Yeah, so if you look at the top in green, right, the, uh, not, the, 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 uh, the top of the chart, right? It says, the first column says Aetna CPPO, basic plan. That is the code for traditional Medicare with a supplement that covers the extra 20%. Um, the other two, it clearly says are Medicare Advantage option one and Medicare Advantage option two. Now, uh, so that's what retirees have now. So if you could take that down and put up the next one, right? The one that's in the current MOU that's proposed, all right. right. This is really the smoking gun um, to see that the, the, the union and the TA know exactly what they're trying to do. So here's what the proposal is. You notice in oh, black okay. there, is, is in black there, it says Aetna option one, Aetna option two. Right. What's missing? What word is missing there? Well, Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage. Turns out both of these plans are Medicare Advantage. Wow. Right. The plan that was removed is the traditional Medicare plan, right? Um, and so could you put up that third page that I sent you now? Yeah, hold on one second. This mm. is the, you remember the whole list of the horrible, frightening demands that the MTA wanted that Richie Davis is touting that he stopped, right? Look at demand, look at, this is from the MTA. This is what they want or want what they wanted. Item three, part B, the first bullet point, right? So post-65 retiree benefits. Post-65 medical benefits are to be covered under the Medicare Advantage plan, eliminating the CPPO plan option, right? Guess what happened? So, so did we concede to the MTA's demand and give them a major give back, which will attack retirees' health care? Absolutely, right? There's no doubt about it now. Wow. Um, I urge you all to look, um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll set, so basically, I, I, I don't know how long ago it was, but there was an article, an op-ed, um, let me see if I can find it, it's really important. It was by, um, basically by people like who work for the banks and who do work for industry in the area. And they basically said, um, here, it's, all right, I'm gonna, uh, 
I'm going to send it to you, Tramel. Okay. All right. Um, I should have done this before, and I apologize for that. Um, but I think it's really. And maybe some people remember it. It was like so. It came from this think tank, right? People who are doing uh, like banks and hedge funds and investors who are like, the New York City Transit's really important to the city, and so they need to get their budget under control. So here are three op three things we want them to do. What's the first one? Opto to cut costs, right? What's the second one? Um, gut. They didn't say gut, but modify work uh, workplace rules so that. The, uh, it's more efficient, right? That stuff like broadbanding and, you know, free package picks, all that stuff that make it easier for them to move us around. What was the third thing they suggested? Move all the employees to Medicare Advantage, right? Right, so if you scroll, you know, you can see this here, right? Uh, basically, right, it's talking about how, um, go down a little bit further, um, let me see. Yeah, so the, here it is. So here's a line. So this is this is the capitalists, right? The people who are talking about right, we need this for the economy, but we need to balance the budget on the backs of working people. So we must innovate, improve signals, one expand to one person train operation, right? So then it says the next paragraph at the bottom, MTA and labor need to modernize modernize how transit workers pick time and location of their shifts, right? So it says, you know, so that's they want to gut our pick rights and then go down right to the next paragraph. You guys there? Yep. Yeah, we, uh... So Mel, can you go down to the next paragraph? I don't think he hears you. Yeah. Is he frozen? Hey, maybe. All right, let's give it a second. Sure. It's always technical difficulties. Yeah, I'll go. Oops. I'm back. I'm back. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, I can just right. I can just read it. Um, right here it is. Ballooning healthcare costs should be restrained. The MTA and TW should follow the lead of New York City in its recent contract negotiations by switching retirees to a high quality. Medicare Advantage plan. Doing this would save the MTA millions without reducing benefits. Um, so that that part, you know, clearly they're speaking from the point of view of the bosses. It's total bullshit. Um, so this was a this was something that they want to do to balance the budget on our backs. And mm -hmm. what we, you know, th the question you have to ask yourself is, right? Um, why do they want to do this? If if the care is just as good, why are they doing it? Right, they're doing it because it's going to save the MTA hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And how is it going to? How do you save money with healthcare if you're? How do you save hundreds of millions of dollars with healthcare? Right, there's only one way to do that. You don't give people as good care. You deny them care. Yeah. You funnel them into less choices. Right, that's the that is the end. Of, you know, that's the be all and end all of this. So, do not believe them when they say the care is just as good. Um, I think a lot of people do have at least some people have Medicare Advantage in their heads because the city originally under de Blasio and then Mayor Adams carried through on it is doing this to city workers, right? And everyone should know that when they tried to do this to city retirees, city retirees were like, hell no, right? They protested at city hall, right? They sued in order to protect it, and they won, actually. They got a judge to stop Mayor Adams, and then he found a workaround, and now they're suing again, right? And they're suing because retirees want the traditional Medicare plan with the, with the rider from, uh, from their employer that covers the extra 20%, right? And our union is giving it up without a fight, right? So as I said at the beginning, we are getting slapped in the face with below inflation raises, right? And probably we probably the only reason they gave us like three percent is because we we decided to sell out retirees. We couldn't even get up to inflation with that, right? That's how disgusting this contract is. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I know I went on for a long time. I apologize. Um, I just wanted to do. Wow. <laughs> I just wanted to do, to do the deep dive into this because I got fooled by it at first, right? I got fooled by it. And so now as I went through it and talked to people, retirees, 
they showed me the way. And so there you go. I mean, and you brought up a good point, Seth. You know, mm -hmm. when you look at our last contract, I think the highest wage percentage we got was 2.75. And then for them after a pandemic, after all the deaths, and everybody liked to focus on the deaths, but there was a lot of infections of COVID also, which lit, which lead to long COVID, mm -hmm. such as what I have. Um, for them to start at three percent is a smack in the face. Like you, you would think, you would think that nothing happened. Like if mm -hmm. this, if our wage percentages was written on a piece of paper, and you see two point seven five three percent, you can't even identify a problem was there. But if you look at the United States inflation rate or the tri-state inflation rate, and you see the inflation rate go from 1.7 to 6 point something, you'll say, wait, something went wrong bad with the economy. What happened here significantly during this time? And our contract, when you look at the wage percentages, do not reflect that. No, I think that, you know, that is hmm. a major issue and we're not being compensated and the union with these fights, these, these, I was calling them picnics or, or outings that they was having where, where they talking about unity, but you see Map Store or One Depot doing a rally this day. You see CD doing a rally this day. And then you see this, where was the collectiveness of what we were supposed to do at Two Broadway to let the bosses know um, that we mean business? Now, Mr. Singleton, you've been around here for a very long time. You've seen a lot of administrations. Where do you rank this current administration? Wow, I will rank um, definitely below the, um, the Willie James, definitely below Willie James, I think. In terms of what? In terms of um, raises, in terms of what? Let, let's, let's do raises, raises and fight. Well, Willie James gave us a good, um, good raise, then we got 22%, although we voted him out. Um, when Tucson came in through the last administration that got us 22% and, and the only administration that got us 22% without going on strike. However, he did sell out the health care. That was the biggest problem with the <laughs> James. <laughs> hmm. Nevertheless, moving forward with the Tucson's and everyone else, we had three year contracts under this administration and the Samuelson administration. Somehow they thought it was smart to go to a five year contract, which is stupid. But let me point this out. When I started in um, 97, I believe it was 97, January of 97, my ex-wife, my first wife, ex-wife, she's a correctional, she was a correctional officer in Rikers Island. Um, the difference in top pay between her salary and my salary back then in 97 was about five to $8,000 difference back then, considering the nature of her job is understandable. But keep in mind, they corrections had a five-year contract, TWU, Local 100, have a three-year contract. So every year it varies from 5,000 difference per um, top pay per year versus 8,000, maybe 7,000 in between. Fast forward to 2023, the difference in top pay from a station agent and a correction officer is about $35,000 difference. So you look at how other organizations were able to progress in terms of pay uh, wages, we, we became very, I would, how can I put it? We got the minimum. We haven't been working as hard. And not, not to say just this administration, but this administration is also a reflection of the previous administration, the previous administration before then. So you got the same characters at the um, the bargaining table with management, who management know very well, know how to talk circles around them, and they are weak, to, to say the least. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. this administration is the worst of the worst. This is why it's important. Unless you're like the police department, I don't like Mr. Lynch. But if you have a president that can deliver, then yes, keeping them in office. But if you have an organization, you keep getting twos and threes, and you can't even afford to, you know, to live here. You got an organization that pregnant women are pulling garbage, exposed around chemicals, harmful chemicals. You got pregnant conductors on a platform in a heat wave. This is your organization. This is your union. And your union will make an argument or make an agreement. We're going to have some type of committee to have this discussion. Police department, correction department, sanitation department, fire department, they all fall under the American Disability Act, likewise with transit. But you don't see police officers fighting crime with a belly. You don't see firefighters, sanitation, everything else out there, you know, doing their job pregnant. But you will see transit workers doing that. And my point is, it's because it's mostly black and brown. 
and the union is so fucking stupid, all they have to do is make it a moral issue. Yes, legally, transit have the right to do that. If you can't perform your your um, your essential core job functions the, under the American Disability Act, the employer doesn't have to keep you employed. But unfortunately, um, a lot of our women, black and brown women down here, are the breadwinners of the household. So to take to a disability check, to go out on a disability is a pay cut. So they can't do that. So they stay around to that eight to nine months pregnant, putting themselves and their child at risk. Rather than the union just shaming this organization for doing so, they'd rather play this stupid game because they're incompetent and stupid. They need to go to school. There's classes out there. They can educate themselves. There's educated people down here that work here. They can put on release mm -hmm. time to help them. They won't do it. They do it because they want to keep themselves fat, their paychecks fat. All they got to do is get elected. They get on 1.5, 100, 150,000 a year, a car, better bathroom, lunch when they want, take days off. No one's going to give that up. They want to secure that mm -hmm. for themselves and their family. But at the end of the day, it does nothing for this organization. You always going to be losing. Now you can have it both ways. Mm -hmm. If you was able to get for your family and do good and help out the union, all good. I have no complaints. But when you when you see this organization slipping into poverty, that's a problem. That's a, especially when we have Jet, um, Chat GPT, um, Open AI, and all these other technologies that's coming out left and right that's going to replace your job, and you're doing nothing to counter that. You're not even thinking about. What can we do to counter this technology wave? Do you have a technology officer? Do you have a, a business analysis officer whose job is to monitor where technology is going? You think Apple sitting around out of nowhere waiting for Samsung or Google to, to, for their next move? No, they're studying mm -hmm. the terrain, the environment. And we're not doing that. So when the day comes to say, well, we're not gonna pay station agents to say hello, goodbye, and, and point out common sense nonsense on a map to customers, we're gonna cut them. When we get to the point where trains can drive itself or have a conductorless train, we're gonna cut them. And that's no way, that's somewhere around 10 years from now or maybe 15 tops. Hmm. Technology is, has always been the biggest threat to unions, technology, research and development, always. I need, a, I need an applause, I need an mm -hmm. applause. You just dropped a lot of bombs there. Like oh, I'm so I, I can go hundred miles. I, 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 was, I, I was looking for I was looking for the band. I thought I was in church for a second. Now I was I was looking for the choir to start yep. singing. So Mark, let That's me right, ask you man. a question. I, I just asked Richard about a question about you know the union. Now um, you came from Staten Island, so you was in ATU, and then yes, you yes. CWU. Do you see a difference between the two unions? Uh, absolutely. Uh, on paper. We're both we're both uh, two large unions, but the there's no there's no similarities as far as how the unions are run. Um, I have like five things I think are the major differences. Is uh, number one solidarity. You know, with the ATU 726, you you know that you're part of a union when you're there. You don't have to. Management doesn't have to to explain to any of the employees or, or when they're dealing with any of the employees, they know that they're dealing, they have to deal with the ATU. So it's, it's just a different um, atmosphere. Um, the level of unionism, transparency, leadership, the morale, it, it's all present with 726. When I came over to Local 100, like I noticed that the main difference is how management deals with us. You know, they deal with you on a level where they feel like they can talk to you however they want. They can they can basically, um, you know, deal with you and uh, discipline you however they want. You know, you have to you have to go searching for the union to protect you. You know, as far as um, ATU, the union is already there. They're present. Hold on, I can't. I can't hear you. I, I forgot. I muted myself. Okay. I apologize. I muted myself. All right. Um, Seth, let me ask you about the maternity paternity leave part of the contract, where you know women get more time than men. Um, and it seems like it circumvents 
actually what the, the state law says about, you know, uh, paid family leave. How do you feel about that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I haven't, I've been doing such a deep dive into the uh, retiree stuff that I haven't spent much time thinking about that. Um, you know, I think more time, I mean, the one thing I do want to say, though, is that isn't there like, I've, I've heard people talk about the fact that um, the thing that disturbs me is that it seems like this was an agreement between the union and management to avoid the TA having to, uh, or having the TA actually buy in to the state program, right? And so, and, and I, you know, I haven't done that analysis analysis myself. I try to be honest and be like, this is the stuff I know. This isn't the stuff I didn't mm -hmm. know. But it does that does seem like what I know about the way that these negotiations go. That the TA is like, oh, okay, well, we're going to give them something that looks good, so that um, we can avoid, uh, you know, paying into this program where they could, you know. Uh, get a lot more. And I believe that I'm trying to remember whether maybe it was Anthony from my local 100 Fight Back Coalition when we, when we did a video last night. I'm trying to remember. Um, but I think that there is a thing where the, the state plan actually isn't just for maternity. It's also for taking care of uh, sick family members, That's right. right? So there would be a lot more, uh, a, a lot more flexibility and a lot more chances for people to use it. And the TA is like, oh no, that's um, right. This is the same organization that said that the fam the National Family Medical Leave Act (FMLA) didn't apply to them, right? And they had to get sued in order to be like, oh yeah, okay, it's a federal law, we have to do that. I guess okay, right? <laughs> that's, that's the way the TA works. So here they're like, oh well, let's let's circumvent this. We don't we won't be part of this program. We'll give maternity leave. People are like, oh wait, it went from two weeks to twelve weeks or two weeks to four weeks, depending on uh, you know which parent it is. But uh, but then all this other stuff is left out that we could have gotten. Um, so I think that's the thing that I'm really focused on. That it's like, you know, some of these this you know it it's not even as good as it sounds because the TA is only doing it to avoid giving us more. Gotcha. Now, uh, uh, Seth, I just want to say Seth was correct. If we went through New York State, we'd be covered for uh, family care. We'd be covered for military family support. Would be covered for birth, adoption, foster. So the TA, I believe they agreed to that so they can control, have way more control over what is the paternity and maternity leave. They they are gonna have control over that, as opposed to us getting a lot more with if we went with the state. Now I ha I have a question for all three of you guys, and I want to start with you, um, Richard. Um, we've seen news articles about the air quality on the subways, in the subways, how it's poor quality. Um, Mark, you work in the depot, you're around diesel fumes. Seth, you're around diesel fumes in some form or fashion, still dust at the least. Um, how do you guys feel about the union not negotiating anything regarding safety and our health in this contract? Mm -hmm. uh, so you want me to go first? Yes, please. Well. My opinion, um, this underground still does the diesel and, and the bus depots and the trains and everything else. That is a part of the, the hazardous health condition that we face every day. But if you really take a, a, a real deep dive at it, you see a, a lot of us, a lot of um, there's transit workers, they end up passing away before retirement, during retirement, or immediately after retirement somewhat. And you look at why and how they passed away, mostly through heart attacks and stroke and so forth. So for example, if I'm, I'm a starter at a station agent 25 years ago, I'm an extra, I gotta deal with the stress and the stressors. Stress is something that we know about that's in our face, that happens every day, the customer jump in our face, supervisors, blah, blah, blah. Stressors are things that register sub, subconsciously that we don't, we're really not aware of, but it definitely plays a role in our health because both conditions, whether it's stress or stressors, plays a role in our cholesterol, which creates cholesterol in our, in our hormones, right? So both um, 
against variables create a situation where they start clogging our arteries. And clogging our arteries is one of the biggest problems that we have. For example, now if I come from my background, I'm African-American, I grew up in an African-American community, and our eating habits and our culture and how we prepare food, it may not be the you know, the healthiest, right? Likewise, you can say with my Hispanic and Caribbean brothers and my Indian brothers and so forth. So when we take that factor and we come to work as a station agent, an extra, I don't, I can't bring my food to work because there's nowhere to store my food. I got to eat whatever's upstairs, which is McDonald's, Burger King, Chinese restaurant, so forth. All that contributes to my health. So now I got to increase unhealthy diet, cholesterol, high sodium, which I'm already bringing to the, uh, into the equation because of my comedian background. And I'm adding that to my work environment. I got to eat what's ever available that's upstairs. I got 30 minutes to shove this down my throat, right? Then I got to deal with the stress at work. Then I got to deal with the stressors at work. So what happens? All this leads to high cholesterol, all this leads to hardening of the arteries. So yes, you're going to have a high incident rate of hypertension. You're going to have a high incident rate of strokes and heart attacks. This is in addition to uh, uh, um, inhaling the exhaust, the steel dust, and the, um, you know, the diesel fumes and everything else. So we work in a very hazardous condition, almost the equivalent to what the coal miners are working except the coal miners probably can bring a lunch. So mm -hmm. this is why I make it a habit. Um, I bring my blood pressure um, uh, machine. I, not only do I check my blood pressure, but I check my coworker blood pressure as well. And the union should be have this research. They should be conducting a, a thorough research on what locations and what percentage of people have hypertension work in a certain environment. That's industrial hygiene. Industrial hygiene doesn't have to just mean noise and, you know, the obvious pollution, but other variables that's causing transit workers to die at a very young rate. So this ties in back into what Steph was talking about with the health coverage. Why are they making these changes? Do they want to pay into these um, insurances where transit workers are, one, not utilizing, you know, the healthcare system enough for it to be profitable for the other organization so they can continue to scale up, or B, um, they're not, they're using it, but they're using too much of it and they're dying and we got to pay up so much money for them. So we want to move away from our responsibility and put it on the government responsibility. Basically, that's what they're trying to do with the healthcare, with the union and MTA. Well, I want to say something before I, I go to Seth so he could answer the same question. Um, back in during Roger Toussaint administration, they did have a health study that broke down a lot of the stressors, our work environment that lead to a lot of these conditions that the Mac loved to put us out for. Like I did not have any high blood pressure issues before I came to transit. Now I catch my pressure, you know, spiking. I didn't have these allergy issues before I came to transit. Now I'm having these major allergies and I'm an asthmatic. Um, Seth, same question for you. How do you feel about our work environments and the union lack of fight to provide a safety net for us regarding that? Yeah, I think I think it's a really good question. Um, and I think it, let me try and get deep with it and connect it up to a lot of different things. Like it connects up to the, like it's safety, and our ability to fight for safety is one of the major powers that we have, right? I know that both you and I have spoken uh, to our audiences about the safety dispute resolution form that we have. And that, um, but, but of course, we elect our leaders to take the lead on that sort of thing. And given how they disrespected of us, us and how many people died of COVID and how many people got sick, it is a perfect setting for us to say, listen, the TA proved to us during the pandemic that our lives don't have any value. Therefore, it is the responsibility of the union and the leadership to push a, a huge safety drive to make sure that our members are safe, right? And that is the thing that we can do to show the TA that we have power, right? And and that power can be used to help us win, right? We could 
It builds our confidence. When the members get involved and the members see that that's going on, then we have a stronger union and we can try and win things in the contract as well. So it's important to say that because we like that there was you were, I agree with that air quality thing that just right. Where did the union go with that? Not only that, but right. What is it? East New York bus depot is currently in violation of FDNY's basic regulations. Like I'm not, you know, I haven't followed this closely, but sprinklers or something, right. It's the perfect thing for the, for the union to say, sorry, this facility is shut down, right. Absolutely shut down. Nothing goes in or out. No one's working there until that's made safe. Right. The timing of that was perfect for us to actually have some leverage, but it wasn't done. Um, and so I think that uh, our union is showing us, right, our leadership, Davis and our VPs and the top four, they're showing us that they aren't going to fight. They aren't going to fight for safety um, and they aren't going to fight for our lives and they aren't going to fight for a good contract. They can't fight. They don't even know what fight is. <laughs> so, so, Mark, same question for yeah. you. you. You know, you, you, you work above ground. Um, yeah, yeah. You're in a bus depot and you're around a lot of the, you know, the uh, diesel fumes and exhaust. Um, yeah. How do you feel about the union not fighting for your safety regarding yeah. that? Uh, I agree the same thing. I actually recently filled out an um, a air quality survey and handed that into the office. Uh, talking about the diesel fumes and talking about how I feel at work. And because um, basically when you when you're in there, you're going to get a headache. You know, after a couple of hours, you're going to um, blow your nose and see black soot. It, it's, you know, it's definitely affecting us. And I know that uh, DCAS has a designation for certain titles, you know, that, you know, but we're not under that title. MTA workers, um, we don't fall into that category for a hazardous job. You know, and that, that's been uh, a big question I have for the union. Why not push to put us in that category to help us with benefits like such as like maybe an early retirement date, you know, mm -hmm. maybe lower it to 22 years or 20 years, you know, something to give us less exposure to those chemicals. You know, either way, we know what we signed up for. We're going to get exposed, but, you know, give us less time. You know, we don't have to have all that, that, that time being exposed 25 years plus, you know. Yeah, we 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 yeah. I totally understand. And you know how the saying go, power concedes nothing without a demand. Mm -hmm. And speaking about that, we've seen the nurses fight, we've seen the mm -hmm. rockets fight, we've seen the, the pilots fight, we even see the writers guild right now fighting. Um, Seth, touch on that for us, please. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important because you know, I mean, <laughs> as as you you know. I, I don't think I've been, uh, you know, I, I got like, what is it, 17, 18 years. Um, it, 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 you start to see it happen every time, right? Um, you know, uh, Tramel and I are an RTO. So, you know, for the last whatever years, we see the same characters. And it's this, it's like the same story that, you know, they get this contract, we've broken it down how it's a really bad contract, but they, you know, they lie about it from one end. And the other strategy they try is they say, Oh, well, you know, look at the pattern, look at DC 37, you know, the, or, or if we reject it, it's going to go to arbitration. So these are scare tactics they use. They aren't saying the contract's good, but they're saying it's all we can get. So you got some of them saying, oh, this is really good. And other ones saying, yeah, it's not so good, but we can't do any better. Right. And thank goodness that there are actually unions out there right now that are fighting and winning. Right. Um, and that connects up to the safety thing. That's the power that we have. We have every right to enforce safety when 110 of our members died due to COVID. The TA has abdicated their authority and the union has every right to take the moral high ground and say, we are gonna enforce safety and, and we're gonna do that. And that is leverage that we have in order to also win a good contract. Um, so when they say, oh, it's gonna go to arbitration, right? They're lying, right? It all depends on how much we fight. And I do want to take, you know, this is going to go back a little ways, but I want to take issue with one thing that Richard said. I think he's spoken really well on a lot of stuff. But one thing that I, after hearing that the union leaders at meetings say stuff again and again, one thing that I promised myself is I'm never going to blame the membership for where we are, right? I'm in solidarity with the members. And, you know, I don't think that 
I, you know, Richard may have misspoken in a certain way, and we could have a discussion about that. But the thing is that we have to remember that the union leadership is spending a huge amount of effort to try and keep our members in the dark. That during election mm-hmm. time, you know, with the two with the two sets of mail of uh, the two mailing lists, ballots not going out to people, right? Things like that. During these contracts, we just talked about how they're trying to mislead us with respect to Medicare Advantage, right? They're putting a lot of effort in to keep members quiet, to keep mm-hmm. us um, uninformed, and to keep us demobilized, mm-hmm. right? And so I put the the blame squarely on the leadership with respect to that. The the unions that Tramel brought up show that if you fight, you can win, right? But our union doesn't have any fight. Our leaders do not want to fight. They see themselves as their job to go in the back, go the go in the back room with the MTA, work up a deal that they're going to try and trick us with, and then try and ram it through. That's not a union militant. That's a union bureaucrat trying to sell us out. And so when they use all these scare tactics about pattern or about um, arbitration, just remember that what these other unions did, and if they started out with a mass rally that got us riled up and they came out to the workplaces and said, this is Mm -hmm. what we can win if we fight for it, five, six, six, whatever, Mm -hmm. but it's going to take a lot of work. Let's start to prepare. Let's, what can we do to tell the MTA that we're serious and actually fight and win that and turn us into an army that's actually going to stand up to the TA, right? Then we have the potential like the nurses had, like Rutgers staff did, like the airline pilots did, like the writers, the, you know, the, the writers are doing now, right? And we can do it even without striking. Striking is, I think, the most powerful tool we have, but we can do it using the mm-hmm. rules and the power that we actually have. Mm-hmm. But, and, and when they say all these things, right? Just remind them that they didn't even try to fight. We didn't even start with a mass rally. And so um, that's the thing. And you know, it's easy to get demoralized, but we have to remember that we as members do have the power, right? Us here starting this conversation could be the beginning of building a network to actually have a protest to protect retirees, right? To say, we're not gonna accept this get back, to let everyone in the union know that and to build a resistance that could actually turn the tide, get you know, vote this contract down and push forward to show the way to fight for a good contract. Now, uh, Seth, like I, I just have a question. Why didn't we hear that from our union president? Everything you just said, we should. We that's... I'll tell you why. I will tell you why, right? Because Richie Davis is the hand chosen person from Utano, who was the hand chosen person from John Samuelson, none of whom had any fight, right? And what I will tell you is the last contract, right? Um, we, when the union, when Utano, was, was it Utano? I guess Utano, uh, didn't hold a rally till late. Um, we organized our own rally. And, you know, it obviously wasn't as big as a full union mm-hmm. rally, but we, in front of two Broadway, we got, um, you know, we got like a hundred people to show up. I think Tramel was there. You were there, right? Yeah. And so, uh, and we spoke at, um, we spoke at two Broadway strongly uh, talking about stuff. And when, so we had a group of people from different divisions. We went to bus depots and we were trying to talk about why we thought the contract was bad. And uh, what's the depot like over at 50th on the West side? What is that? Quill? Uh, Quill. 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 Yeah. So we were there having good conversations, being respectful, having good conversations about what we thought about the contract. Guess who threw us out of the depot? Yeah. The union, Richie, Richie Davis. Huh. <laughs> right? He he actually threw union members out of the depot who were trying to talk about the contract. And we said, we're dues paying union members. We have a right to be here to have a conversation. Uh, and he said, you know, it, it, what kind of, I said, what kind of solidarity is this? And he said, I don't care about solidarity. Right. That's who our president is right now. Right. And Richie, if you're watching, we remember, right. You're a union president who doesn't believe in solidarity, right? And that's why you work with the TA to sell out retirees and sell out your own members. Mm, that sounded so crazy just now. Um, but Rich, you know, I, I mean, seen you taking notes, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, to, to my brother, Steph, you know, we can agree to disagree. But at the end of the day, I believe that uh, the union is the membership. The membership is responsible for what's going to take place tomorrow. If they vote and act a certain way, they can they have the power to get rid of the current administration if they choose to. 
Now, if they choose to constantly um, vote these people back in and don't take an active you know, um, action into uh, making changes, then you get what you deserve. You can't sit here and cry about, oh, we got a shitty contract. When you voted these people in, you did it last time, you did it time before that. When are you going to wake up? It's the membership must wake up. These current administrations, the current administrators, they was elected in office. Again, they live in fat. They good. They looking out for them. It's a struggle. We're a team when we're struggling. But once we get elected, we become individuals, right? It's about me now. Now I got my chest out. Now I'm walking around with management. Some of these union meetings look like there's correction officers walking around the goddamn union meetings. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Mm. This is what they think of you. This is an organization mm. that had you pat you on the back, the union and the management pat you on the back, your heroes moving heroes, right? You're feeling good about yourself. I can't stay home. I'm an essential worker. Meanwhile, your Facebook timeline look like a memorial. You come to work, you hear mm -hmm. about other people die. And what they do, they cut your ABAs. They cut your PLD. You can't take it for four to six months, at least in stations department, right? And then they cut the number of um, AVAs being awarded per tour. Used to be 40, now it's 25. I have no idea what it is today. Then you call out sick and they show up to your house. Leave you no mm. alternative but to how else you're going to get things done. But mm. this is an organization that shitted on you during a pandemic. And uh, single single thing. I, I, got, I got a question. You get, you get yeah, a chance. Sure. And here we are today crying about looking at this contract says like shit when you should you know it's going to be shit you've been shitted on all this time you like being shitted on that's mm. when mm. we wake the hell up and say hey i'm tired of being shitted on and pissed on then we can have something you got people i, I met people not just myself there's a lot of people down in transit, especially in the station department, well-educated project managers came from there, came from there, all this education degrees, but the union won't put them on. You got VPs can't even fucking write a sentence. Ignorant. You got another chairperson who's out three times a week doing dialysis. How's that helping the membership? But you the mm. first one to talk about union membership when you're robbing the membership. Stay the fuck home. Your quality of life is much better than a paycheck, stupid. But they're mm. bringing ass um, too much to the late Rich um, Nelson Rivera. I don't know if it's true or not, but it said he worked with the union to the last days. Me personally, I wouldn't have done that. My family's more important. I'm going to spend my quality of life with my family. Stop promoting stupidity. Mm. Stop promoting mm. looking for a paycheck because you're going to be dead and you're going to get anything. You're going to be dead. Now, I want to. Say, oh, I, mm, I want to say, you mm. know, what I what I like about this discussion is that Seth seen something that he didn't agree with you, and you came back and as as gentlemen, as men, having a discussion. This is what being a part of a union is about: agreeing to disagree, but keeping it respectful. And both of them have their valid points. Mm -hmm. I see what Steph saying. I see what you're saying, Rich. I feel the same way. You know, the members do own a certain part of this responsibility of what's happening to us. You know, um, it's 40,000 members, only 11,000 members vote, right? Yeah. And then and then what you hear is that, oh, I didn't get no ballot, but let your paycheck not show up on time. Exactly. You, know, you had 130 Livingston mm -hmm. knocking on doors, you had 195 Montague, you had two Broadway asking questions, but your ballot don't show up. You don't care. Yeah. And, and to all the members out there that's talking about, oh, I'm securing the bag. You're not securing the bag until you get in trouble and know how to get out of that because the MTA is constantly trying to take your bag. Uh, securing the bag is not coming to work and punching the clock. <laughs> and what's the bag? I mean, to hmm. find a bag. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Starting selling for an undergrad, you know, with, say, computer science is 150. What's the bag? You're killing yourself, putting in all this work to get 150. You, you, you're working mad hours, doing all this overtime, breaking mm -hmm. yourself down. You don't even know your kids anymore. <laughs> and you just want back. <laughs> you don't even know your uh, wife anymore. Sing Singleton, how do we bring back the, the culture of unionism back into Local 100? By that, that administration. You got to change the administration. Right now, we're not a union. We're a collection of individuals looking up for mm -hmm. looking up our own interests. 
I'm going to mm. get this bag, got this benefit, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about anything else. I'm not going to union meetings. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. That's who we are. Mm. But mm-hmm. meanwhile, you look at, if you look at the, the Great Recession, and then you look at what happened with the pandemic. What we're seeing is the reorganization of labor, right? Mm. It went from one point um, being in 2000, I guess, 2008, where they changed the educational requirements in terms of what you can be and how you can get there to be, right? Um, in terms of mostly, Trump was saying this a lot, and this is what a lot of white folks got confused at when you talk about China. China, yes, was taking your job, but not in the sense of the way they made it to be. If you were a regional director for some um, small business, say you, you have 2,000 employees or whatever it may be, and you're making, um, and you don't have a college degree and anything else, but you've been in this business for a long time, and you're a white male, you're going to go up the chain of social mobility, right? But when the 2008 recession hit, they changed the qualif- the, uh, the qualification and the criteria in order for you to be a regional district manager, right? Mm-hmm. Mainly because China was manufacturing certain parts that American factory was making. Right. So now you have eBay, you go to Amazon, you see if it's shipped from China, it's shipped from the USA. So that destroyed those jobs. Those organizations shut down. So here we are as a white male coming in the game. I don't have a high school diploma. I want to get the, I want to be regional director again. They're saying, no, you cannot. You don't have the skill set or the qualifications. So now we got the pandemic. Somebody pressed the fast forward button on the pandemic with the Zoom and everything else. Now you got to have a shitload of qualification to get a job to pay $100,000 a year. Not just a college degree, which I have, but you also got to get certifications and licenses. Mm. Right? So everything changes. So what does that mean to you, to a, a laborer who don't have the skill set? We'll say low-skilled laborer. What does that mean to you? It means that technology is going to replace your job. The job of the union is to make sure how can we find an alternative for those people? Right. Um, how can we convince them or tell them that they they need to go through this training and that training? You've seen the same things happen in the auto, automobile industry. Right. They went from combustible engine to electric engines right now. All of them apprentices has to be retrained, not just on how to work certain equipment, but how to code and software and, and, and everything else. Right. But do we mm-hmm. have you know, trained workers, especially in station department? Oh, I don't want to do that. That requires using my brain. I don't want to do mm. this. I don't want to do that. So the responsibility, I, I don't want to sound condescending or anything mm-hmm. like that. At the end of the day, we're moving so fast. You have to get on board with these changes. You're going to have to use your brain. You just can't come to work and punch in and punch out and just point your fingers uptown, downtown. It doesn't work that way anymore. You're going to mm-hmm. be replaced. And that's what's happening in the station department. And the last thing I'm going to say on this topic is that when it comes to um, station agents and cleaners and station department, human resources is gonna have a retention and, and a, a recruitment issue. It's gonna be hard for them to recruit people and it's gonna be hard to, for them to hold people in that position because they're gonna say, why should I work for station department a, as a cleaner for $17, $19, $20 an hour where I can work for Target $20 an hour and I have my whole weekend. I can do Grubhub, DoorDash, I can do fans only. I can make my own money. I don't need you. And that's what the restaurant industry is going through right now. So this whole mm-hmm. market, the whole market is changing. And we need to change with the market. If we don't change with the labor market, we're going to be left behind. Hmm. What's your thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, let me go. <laughs> I'm not sure what to say to a lot of that. That's like outside of... Uh... The, the stuff I've been thing. thinking about, but <laughs> yeah, I know, but, I know. But, but but Mark's Mark's original question, like how do we get back to unionism? Like I think my answer to that, and it gets back to the I think the, the interesting discussion that Richard and I are having. Like Richard's answer was, we need a new administration. Um, I, I I mean, I, I would say that that's not the first step, right? If you look at the history of if you look at the history of unions and you see where. Um, the old leadership has been swept out. It's already, it's always come after there's been a groundswell of militancy among the ranks right. itself. Mm-hmm. And often one of the last steps is that a new leadership is put into place through elections. Um, and so I think that, and I, I think it's a tension that we have to think about and talk about that to 
and it gets back to what I was saying with respect to this contract. Like, um, you know, I'm a socialist. I believe in the power of workers to change society and that workers should actually run society. Um, and a step like in that direction is that we as work, you know, I, I do agree with Richard when it says we are the union, right? The members are the union, the mm -hmm. people up there, right? They are showing that they're not the union every day and that they're actually against us. They're on the side of management. And that's true in a lot of unions these days, right? So yeah. we should um, we should be organizing to try and build a membership to let members know that we have the power to try and take action in our workplace, to make our, to build the militancy, militancy, to learn the history of unions and how they became so strong and how we won when we won, right? That's Shutting true. down cities, taking over factories, right? This is a great history that people don't know. So, and that we should put that into effect. And this kind of contract with a sellout where we're stabbing retirees in the back could be a step to actually energizing us and leading a fight that gets mm -hmm. us a good contract and rejuvenates the union. Um, at the same time, right, we shouldn't say we're just going to work from the bottom, that we should be running in elections, right, to um, as, as militants, as people who want to energize the members, right? And, you know, I think that's one of the differences, and I'm, and I'm proud of this, at least with respect to my coalition, the Local 100 Fightback Coalition, is we're always honest that when we say we're running for office, we're not saying, hey, we have all the answers, and if you put us in, we're going to make everything better, right? That's not... That's not how unions change. But we do say that we're running in this campaign to build a movement. And if we do get elected, we will do everything we can to put power in the hands of the members and to help organize into an army where we can actually stand up to the TA. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Steph, to your point, I just mm -hmm. want to, when I said change administration, I misspoke. I, I should have said we need a culture change in this administration or within this mm -hmm. as a whole. When we start putting the union members first, then we can start moving forward to make the change that we need to, to make. But to your point, when okay. you talk about uh, the history of unions, then you're looking at a situation where you have this union, TW Local 100, which is majority minorities. And if you look at the history of unions, union itself was basically a bunch of white men who did not want the newly enslaved black people who released well, the newly released slaves, enslaved black people to take their jobs. So he created this thing called unions to protect blacks or the slaves from taking their jobs. Then when you look at TW, and then you look, you fast forward, you look at a situation where capitalists during the 40s, 50s, and 60s used to go to the South and recruit black people during the Great Migration, this is what helped um, motivate or inspire the, the Great Migration, and to come to these cities, Detroit, New York City, Chicago, these manufacturing cities to break up strikes. So Blacks became scabs. So there's a, a somewhat of a, a, a disconnect with unionism mm. and color, you know what I'm saying, especially Blacks, especially during the Great Migration. So here we are. Absolutely. We Right, in this mm -hmm. organization, right? And this is an entire an Irish organization. You're not gonna see if someone to be able to excel through the ranks like Samuelson. Samuelson is Irish. This is the Irish organization. Yes, he's gonna make it from being the president. He's gonna occupy two seats, the president of TWU and the vice president of the international. He's gonna become the international president because it's an Irish organization. What we have here, you have a situation where whites, right? And blacks, majority, the minority are whites seem to have made a deal, right? The Italians and the Irish to implement situational policies that will advance their own agendas, right? On the backs of blacks. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. and that's the that's basically is what's happening. So yes, you're gonna you're gonna have your I'm gonna put Richard in this position, but before I give you this position as administrative vice pre vice president, I need you to sign this contract before you become vice president of station department to do this, that, and the third. So your title is constantly giving people of color dumb advice over and over again. He did it with <laughs> Goldman. He did it with Richie Davis, the dumbest shit. He's been here for 45 freaking years. He still ain't got it. Why are you listening to this clown? <laughs> He's a clown. 
But <laughs> then you don't see Samson taking advice from his predecessor. No. But when it comes to black leadership, it's always this, you are incapable, incompetent, stupid. You need a daddy on your side. I'm going to give you the mm -hmm. wrong information so you can end up looking like a fool in front of your own people. No, look. Way, I'm not even going to um, put up African-American. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put someone from the Caribbean because that's what a lot of white people feel comfortable around. They do not feel comfortable around an educated black man, African-American. No, if you look at management the same way, the vice president of labor relations, the vice president on diversity and inclusion, right? The vice president of human resources, all for Caribbeans. It's not an accident. <laughs> Let me tell you something about the, the uh, it's mm. funny that you mentioned that because I had management who was at the table during the contract negotiations say that Richie Davis is not negotiating the contract and that Utano and Samuelson was negotiating the contract and they don't understand why they not giving Richie Davis his own, um, you know, space to do what he need to do. And they did find that pretty strange, but I want to circle back and I want to talk about something. I, I would say obtuse, that $30 million staircase. Yeah. Right. $30 million staircase. Seth, let me ask you this. If you know, what's the, what's the um, percentage point in millions? For each each wage percentage point, what is it in millions? Yeah, you know, I was um, uh, so I, I put it up on Facebook. I think I, I slightly overestimated, right? It's not hard to do. You just take the what you think is the average salary of the employees, multiply it by the number of employees, and divide by a hundred, right? And that so that gives you a hundredth of the the uh, total salary. So let's just what what do you think the total set? Let's we can go over it again right now. No, I think the average salary. Just give me a just what? give me a number like what for one percent okay. how much would it cost the MTA? Uh, give me one second. Okay, six uh, thousand times. Y'all see how real this show is? We got Seth doing math live. About twenty, about twenty five million. All right, so look, um, Richard, thirty million to bring to build the staircase. It seemed like they didn't even blink an eye to do that. That could have been a wage percentage for us as the members. We could have got. 4.5%, 4% or whatever the case is. How do you feel about that $30 million staircase and things still going wrong on the property? Our facilities are decrepit. You know, our work environments are poor. How do you feel about that? They don't see you as people. They don't see you as human beings. Basically, that's what it is. I mean, I always made an argument. I made it a lot of times on, on social media and I and also comes up in, in my discussion in the classrooms, you have two um, constitutions in this world. You have the, um, the constitution one through 12 and you have one 13 through 15. One through 12 is for white folks, 13 through 15 is for black folks. Basically the 13th to the 15th amendment is the, um, the right to vote, the right to be the citizen and the right to um, what? To, to vote, to be the citizens and I forgot the last one, my bad. I'm I brain stuck. It's been a long day. Sorry. But basically, you have um, two constitutions. These constitutions, you notice they're always fighting your right to vote. They're always fighting your right to be uh, the right to be a human being. They're always fighting your right to be a citizen. Look on TV as yourself. They're always rearranging the, the, the way you vote, who can vote where and where they can vote and when they can vote. Right. You get shot and killed on TV. You're not even a human being. You're not even a citizen because you got to deal with racism. So there's 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, right to be the citizen, right to be the human being, and the right to vote. They always was holding that against mm -hmm. you. So when it comes to these staircases, I'm not surprised. Of course, they will build a staircase for everyone else. When it comes to their own workers, the black and brown workers, no, they can't do it for you. They can't even see that even happening remotely. So you got to go in these horrible bathrooms, horrible situations, and they got money for everything else except for you at the end of the day. And the union knows it. But again, if you're on union release, do you really want to go back to that? Do you really want to go back to the horrible bathrooms and horrible work conditions? You like the extra pay? And, and again, I think Tramel mentioned it on one of his shows or somebody on the show mentioned this union release needs to be reevaluated. It's, it's totally working against our membership. You got people who are just there to support the, the current administration. They bring no value to the organization whatsoever. They do absolutely nothing. 
but they want to get that 20 percent 20 hour or whatever hour you know extra pay and so forth and so forth and it's it's really like a drug it's hurting our administration completely i got you seth where you at i got a question to ask you before before um you know time wind down you know um richard was bringing up race a lot and i want to ask you a question do you think race plays a factor between the way um new york city transit is treated compared to Long Island Railroad and Metro North? Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, when, when Richard was talking about that, that was actually a point that popped into my head that I that I wanted to say about. That's funny. We're thinking along the same lines. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, um, it's it's um, it's it. So let's just break down the facts. Right. So when we talk about ridership right and who actually is the backbone that runs this city and moves people right which which agency is it right new york city transit york right city. Hmm? it's not even close right it's where, where do we move like how many people do we move a day like five million five million yep. he said, he said yeah. 5.5 million uh, yes. a couple of right. days ago richard day and before before the pandemic, when things were crazy, right? I mean, when we, we was at peak, was it like 8 million? Yeah. Right? You compare that to numbers around the country, right? But then just compare it to Long Island Railroad and Metro North, right? And their, their numbers aren't even like a tenth of that. So we work under more difficult positions. We make the money for the system. We run, you know, we make the city run. And when you compare wages with Long Island Railroad, when you compare their workplace conditions and I'm, I don't get I'm not getting them down right what I don't want to do is be like oh you know let's tear their workers down right I, as a socialist I think we all deserve what they deserve right mm -hmm. um and so but the 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 answer to your question is right when you pose that question when you pose that issue it's like well why is that the case why are their wages so much higher why is the are the tr are the trains so much nicer Right. There's only one answer to that, and that's when you break down the workforce, what the racially who they are, and you break down the ridership and the and the areas that they run through. Right. And that's right. That is systemic racism of the United States that we see in all aspects. Right. That um, that is now like basically a dirty word for MAGA and for Trump. They're like, it doesn't exist. Right. You can't even. You can't even teach about it now in college and the schools in Florida, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's the truth. It's built into every institution that we have, but and that's that, and that's what it. Yeah, um, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I also want to point out that Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and Amtrak they fall under the commuter rail. They are commuter rails, so they fall under the Railroad Act. Likewise, with the um, the um, the, uh, the traffic controllers. So they had to they have to petition Congress at least two times for them to be able to go on strike. Normally, the president of the United States gets involved and give them a substantial wage. The uh, the Railroad Act is very significant in terms of because they have the ability to interrupt commerce, and we don't need that. All the the, the ports and everything will be a mess. So they have a responsibility. The government has responsibility to treat them well. Now, transit comes later. Of course, we fall under the, the Taylor Act and all this other stuff going on. So we don't have the same advantages as they have. What we should have had in this contract is the ability for transit workers to move over, to have a certain percentages of transit workers to move over to Long Island Railroad and Metro, uh, Metro North. A certain group, a number of people uh, should have the options to move if they choose to do so against everyone else. And that was will probably change the, I guess, the pay dynamics. Because if mm -hmm. transit workers, 25% of the of transit workers have the options of switching over to whatever uh, availability availability in uh, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, then you create a situation where transit is going to have a difficult time retaining their employees, right? But right now, you got to go through all these uh, um, conditions to become a Long Island Railroad worker. I was called to be a Long Island Railroad in 2017. And I would tell you, when I went to that interview, and most of the people there, there are some signal people, but a lot of the people there were white and young. 
And they would tell me their father told them how to treat the sick, how to learn the signals and everything else. And they got to hook up in HR. So that's how it works. Mm. So they're going to make, so why go to college? You can make 150, start and pay for a, uh, say, uh, a locomotive engineer, right? Like myself would have been an easy 100,000 because the system is set up differently in terms of how you make money. If I'm scheduled to drive a refuse train and I'm driving a customer train, I get two days pay for one day's work. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They got all type of incentive built into their contract, into the whole Railroad Act that we don't have. So I will argue that the union should have created a situation, since we all fall under the MTA umbrella, right? That set aside a number of positions that trans workers that have the opportunity to switch over without penalty, regardless of their record. That's an so interesting idea. Be a game that's that's an interesting perspective. All right, before before we get out of get out of here, I want to ask you guys each: um, Why should the members vote yes or no to this current contract? And, and I want you to tell me in a minute. I'll we'll make it quick. All right, I, I think I'll go I'll first. Mark. Yeah, start with you. Mark. Yeah, um, I would tell the members to vote no because you know twenty five million dollars on a staircase. Uh, the Second Avenue subway, they could mismanage a hundred million dollars. When it comes to your contract, they bring out every mathematician to negotiate it to a T to slash every benefit you got. So, you know, let's let's make a smart decision here. Let's go back to the table. You know, we're not here, to, you know, to 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 get, you know, we're not lucky to be here. You know, we deserve to be here. We work every day, we work hard. You know, fight for what's yours. Fight for your family. Don't don't just fold. Love it, Seth. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to have self respect, right? One hundred ten of us died or more during the pandemic. People, uh, thousands got long COVID. We kept the system running, right? We don't get hazard pay. Our raises are below inflation, and we stab retirees in the back, forcing them onto Medicare Advantage. Right. That's that's the MTA telling us that we're worthless. Right. And we don't we're not human beings and we don't deserve what we know with that we deserve. We make the city run. We kept the city run during the pandemic. And this contract is an insult and it and it stabs retirees in the back. We should organize a vote no campaign and stand up, vote the contract down and build a movement that can actually fight for a good contract like other unions we've seen have done. Thank you, Seth. Richard? Yeah, vote yes if you would like to be an idiot. You want to be <laughs> stupid. You want to be impoverished. You want to continue with this stupidity. Vote yes because you are a fucking moron. But vote no if you are smart enough to say, look, I'm better than this. I can do better. I will vote no to get this current administration wait and, uh, and get these people out of uh, office and vote another administration in office and let them deal with the, with the contract. Well, you, look, I, I love all you guys' answers. I would like to thank you guys personally. This went better than what I, I imagined. Um, I was on this Zoom with three scholars, obviously. Um, I, I learned a lot you know, from all you guys. The conversation was respectful. I think that we need to have more of these conversations. Um, I'm gonna make my platform available to create a lot of more of these conversations. For a lot of this Zoom, we had over 100 people watching live which was which was excellent. Um, so, you know, we gotta we gotta to the people watching, we gotta share out these lives. We gotta share out this these this information. Let people make decisions. People looking for information. The union is not giving people information. You have regular rank and file members doing the research, taking time away from their families. Each one of us is taking time away from our families right now to provide mm -hmm. information to provide a platform where. The people who are supposed to be doing it, we don't hear from them. We see them when it's election time. We see them when it's time for us to sell something. You probably seen them yesterday at family day, but that's about it. You rarely see them. Um, Seth, you know, we we had our 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 organizations had our back and forths, you know, throughout the years. Um, before I even thought about doing this Zoom, I said I have to reach out to Seth. Um, you know, just to show that we could come together on on issues. 
Richard, me and you went through some battles to ourselves. <laughs> You know, we, we went through some people that probably don't remember or, or crazy. People probably don't remember or whatever the case is, but you know, he was he Richard was another person I didn't see eye to eye with. You know, I, I will I will be the first to apologize to both Seth and Richard on you know how I may have how I may have behaving, but I'm very passionate on what I do here. You're always going to be a disruptor. You are. We need you in this organization. We need <laughs> like you in this organization. We don't have to agree to uh, agree on everything. We're going to fight. That's the whole, you know, purpose of this exchange. You know, it makes us better. It makes us realize, you know, what we can do better and how we can do things differently, you know, moving forward. But I always say, you know, Tramel Thompson and to the whole group, progressive action, you know, crew and team, you guys are a disruptor. You guys are what TW Local 100 needs. So keep up the good work, keep up the fight. And I can see you guys doing amazing things in the future along with Steph and, and, and Mr. Mark on, on the Zoom as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, and for Mark, for, for Mark, I don't know where mm -hmm. he came from. You know, when these new guys come into my inbox, <laughs> I'll be trying to make sure they ain't fake pages and you know, all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. But you know, Mark was sending me messages these past few days, like inspiring me letting me know that the work that I was doing was not going in vain. And, um, you know, that that's what sometimes leaders need to, to hear that, mm -hmm. you know, that their work is being appreciated. And he was coming with his own ideas, so it wasn't no hesitation to get him on. But next time we got to, ladies, where y'all at? Yeah. Next time we got to have yeah. the ladies on. You know, next time we got to have some ladies on. But um, to you gentlemen, I would like to tell you, thank you to the, to the people who's watching. Please share out the live. Let's continue to spread the information in solidarity. Catch you guys later. Peace. Peace. All right. Hi, everybody. Peace. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh.